John chapter 13. It is not a coincidence that this morning we spent our time in John chapter 13 and that tonight I will continue to preach from there. The lesson will be different. But it's not a coincidence. The thing is that the word is so so broad, so full of lessons that we could take one passage and preach many different lessons from it. Because that's the way the, uh, the Holy Spirit intended for it. He intended for us to read it and to live as we chew on it and, and survive off of it and learn many, many lessons from it. So this evening, we're going to look at it maybe from a different perspective. I appreciate your presence here as we're opening our Bibles to John chapter 13. I want to remind you that when our brother Fletcher talks about his mom and he asks for us to, or reminds us, that she is so ecstatic and happy when she receives phone calls and cards and, and things of that nature. She suffers from Alzheimer's. And I think that many of us are very well acquainted with that terrible disease. But it's not a nice disease. It's a disease that just affects that mind and, and respects no one. It's a terrible disease because it destroys what we hold so dear, our memories. It's a disease that just destroys the things that we just love so much, our memories, what we cherish so much, our memories. So it would do us well to heed the petition that our brother Fletcher has made that we do call on his mom. We send her a card. But if we could go out to Aspen and visit her, I'm sure that she would really appreciate it. She might not remember that we even went. But at that moment, she would be happy. John chapter 13. It's one of those chapters that sometimes it's easy to get so caught up in a controversy surrounding a passage that we fail to see the great lessons contained therein. You know, like when we read 1 Corinthians, we get so caught up with the head covering. Whether it applies to us today or whether it applied to the church at Corinth then or if it was a universal commandment to all the New Testament churches or not. Or whether in John chapter 13, whether Jesus was commanding the foot washing of all saints, of all churches, of all time, whether he's commanding it to us now or not, that we fail to see what Jesus is actually commanding, what he's actually teaching. Sometimes we get so, so caught up in nitpicking and trying to split hairs that we fail to see the true meaning, the true teaching that Jesus is trying to get across. In the 13th chapter, we're going to read what Jesus was actually trying to get across to his disciples and to us as well. This is one of those chapters, one of those lessons that I believe Jesus is really wanting us to be like him, to imitate him, to be just like him. But as we read this chapter, I want, to, want you to think about why or what was happening in his life. He had come to the end of his life, but more importantly, at the end of his ministry. Remember that Jesus, at the age of 30, had begun his ministry, introduced by his cousin, John the Baptist. Here goes, or there goes the one that can take away the sins of mankind, said his cousin. And by, uh, with that introduction, John the Baptist begun, began to disappear from the scene. Eventually his head was cut off and Jesus then took over. As Jesus took over, began to call on men to be part of his posse, if you will. He called on men to be those that he would later uh, identify as his apostles, but at first his disciples. These disciples would grow in stature and knowledge and courage. They would be the ones that would go throughout the entire world according to the Great Commission and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it was after that introduction, three and a half years later, that we come to John chapter 13 that Jesus has come to the end of his road. He has already prayed and given thanks to the Father. He's already identified all of the things that are going to happen. 
He's told the disciples. He's told the Jews. He's spoken about the temple. He's already said all the things, identified all the things that must happen. How he must be lifted up and put on the cross just like that serpent Nahushtan in the Old Testament was lifted up. He's already identified that he must die on the cross, be buried in the third day resurrected. He, he's already said these things. He's tying up loose ends, if you will. But he needs to make sure that his disciples learn one important lesson. A lesson that really escapes our knowledge even to this day. A lesson that we struggle with even to this day. And that's a lesson on humility. A lesson on humility. A lesson that we try as adults to teach children on how to be humble. A lesson that some adults have, have, have had so much difficulty throughout their entire lives to learn and to apply and to live by. A lesson that even older men who desire the office to be an elder of a church must be able to be humble if they desire to be an elder. Well, let's read here in John chapter 13, the first 17 verses. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that, the, that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the very end. During the supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from the uh, that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which, we, which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, why do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will realize later. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus then said to him, if I do not wash your feet, then you have no part with me. Peter then said to him, Lord, then wash only, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Well, Peter wanted him to bathe him. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all twelve of you are clean. For he knew that the one who was betrayed him, for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know that I do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am your teacher and Lord. If I then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. And truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who, uh, who sent, excuse me, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, notice in verse 1 that the scripture says that Jesus loved to the end. Now, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? That someone can love another person to the end. Can love that person no matter what. No matter what their shortcomings, what their foibles, to the, no matter what their diseases might be. He can love that person to the end. The pain of friends, family, and even enemies making sinful choices did not dissuade Jesus from loving us. Even among him, among his friends, the twelve, including Judas Iscariot, Jesus loved the twelve to the end. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, God loved us. Jesus loved us. He loved us to the end. Notice with me there in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even die. 
But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Knowing that he was about to be denied and betrayed by his own disciples did not stop Jesus from loving them. Aren't you thankful this truth has been revealed? That Jesus, even though he was in the midst of 12 men, one that was about to deny him, loved them to the end. And that Jesus, although he knew that when he came into this world, that he would be denied, that he would be hated, and that he would be put on the cross by people that would hate him, murdered, that he still died for them. He died for you and I. Jesus has loved us to the end. So when Jesus came there in in John chapter 13 for that Passover meal. He did it to teach us how we ought to love. When Jesus girded his garments and took the wash basin and the towel and got on his hands and knees to wash the feet of his disciples. It wasn't to teach us that we ought to wash each other's feet, although we should if the occasion demands it. It was to teach us how we ought to love each other. Unconditionally and to the end. Ignoring the foibles, ignoring our shortcomings. Ignoring even the traits of a Judas Iscariot to the end. But look there in John 13 again in verse 3. And the reason that Jesus was able to love to the end was because Jesus had a goal in mind. Whenever we have a goal, a solid goal, the struggles and the fights are worthwhile fighting. It's worthwhile to fight. It's worth fighting. It's worth giving up things when we have a goal in mind. Verse 3, he says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from the God and, and was going back to God. That was the goal that Jesus had in mind. As we read in Hebrews 12, verse 2, that he endured all the pain and suffering on the cross because it was a joy. Well, what was the joy of enduring everything on the cross? That he was going back. To his pre-incarnate state. He was going back. To sit at the right hand. Of God. He was going back to take his throne. So he came from God. And according to verse 3. He was going back to God. So all the sacrifices. Makes it worth. Everything that he did. So getting on his hands and knees to wash the feet of his disciples, to humble himself, to love them to the end, to suffer even there at the, at the feet of Judas Iscariot, because he washed the feet of Judas as well. And how many of you could stomach that? Think about it. He washed the feet of his disciples, did he not? And Judas was in that group of disciples. Could you have washed the feet of Judas? Could you have done that? Knowing that he is the one that's going to betray you. But Jesus loved them to the end. Because he had a goal in mind. Doesn't the fruits of the labor make the labor worthwhile? Consider the dedication and sacrifice of athletes. That the goals make worthwhile. I've seen there at school. The middle school, we have an Olympic size swimming pool and diving well. Where students from Florida, from from, uh, Florida College, what am I talking about? From uh, Franklin College come out to practice and to dive and to swim. And they they dedicate hours and hours and hours of of swimming and, and coaches yelling at them and getting out of the water and back in the water and doing it all over again and all over again. And 
I look at him and I think, what kind of a fool would do that over and over again? What kind of a fool would endure all those things? Then I see the medals that they earn. The records that they break. And I see the shape that they're in. And the shape that I'm in. They have a goal in mind. Jesus had the goal in mind. Of redeeming the world. Of going back to the Father. Just like Jesus. We ought to have a goal in mind. But back to John 13. Verses 4 and 5. Not only did Jesus love to the end. And did he have a goal in mind. But he was humble. Beyond measure. When he got up from supper. And laid aside his garments. And taken a towel. And girded himself. He poured the water into the basin. Began to wash the disciples feet. And wiped them with the towel. With which he was girded. Now. This is one of those occasions. That I wish I was a fly on the wall. Don't you? We know what Peter's reaction was. Because the Bible tells us. What do you think Judas's reaction was? During the Lord's Supper, Judas's reaction was, as he put his hand in the dish with Jesus, he said to Jesus, it's not I, is it, Lord? It's not I that's going to betray you, is it? Lord, is it I, is it I? And then Jesus says, you've said so. Yes, it's you. But here when Jesus is washing the feet, do you think Judas might have been one of those that, that was anxious to get his foot washed as well? Was he, was he one that lined up and, and took his sandals off and, and, and was one of those that wanted to have his feet washed first? I just wonder what Judas' reaction might, might have been. Or if he put himself at the end of the line or at the front of the line. Remember that when Jesus was on earth... He was God in the flesh. If anyone had the right to be served, if anyone had the right to have their feet washed, it was Jesus, yet he served. He girded his his garments. He's the one that started washing the feet of the disciples. If you go back and think, if you go back and do a memory check of when Jesus began his ministry, He always looked for ways to serve other people, didn't he? He always looked for ways to serve, but we as humans look for ways to be served. Right? What's our attitude when we go to a restaurant? And we don't get quite the service that we think we ought to get. Have you ever acted like a, like a spoiled kid at a restaurant because you don't get the service you ought to get? After all, I'm paying, I'm going to leave a tip. Or at least I was going to leave a tip. All right. You imagine Jesus going to a restaurant and acting that way? Hey, hey. But maybe that's comparing apples to oranges. I don't know. Jesus looked for ways to serve. Not to be served. He looked for ways to leave examples of how we ought to humbly behave. Look at verse 15 of John chapter 13. He says, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. We're to do as he did. That doesn't mean that we are to literally wash one another's feet unless, as I said earlier, the situation calls for it. But it means that we are to humble ourselves and serve others. Now, where do you think the Lord's church? How far do you think the Lord's church would be or would go in our society? If we as individuals, representatives of Jesus, representative of the Lord's church on this earth would go 
and we were just like Jesus. Remember in the early 2000s, when people started wearing those bracelets, what would Jesus do? It was a fad. I mean, it was a very, very popular fad. What would Jesus do? But we didn't need a bracelet or a shirt to know what Jesus would do. Reading texts like this here in John chapter 13, we know what Jesus would do because we know what Jesus is like. And Jesus tells us in verse 15, For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Aren't you thankful for the portrait that we have of Jesus while he was here on earth? We don't have to wonder what he was like. We don't have to wonder what he would like for us to be like. Because he tells us what he was like. He tells us what he wants us to be like. Just like him. So here's the question that I leave you with. To think about for the rest of this week. How well do you resemble Jesus? Would people be able to look at you and know that you are a disciple of Christ? Or would you have to tell them that you are a Christian? Would, pe would people be able to know by looking at you and looking at your actions and how you interact with others, how you carry yourself, how you speak, that you are a child of God? Or would you have to identify yourself? How well do you resemble Christ? John chapter 13 and verse 15. I have done these, these things so that you could be just like I am, said Jesus. Think about these things together. We stand and sing.